to my channel. Today I will be doing a video, a Dead Rockstar Facts video, about Brian Connolly. I saw this coming since I made a video just like this about his colleague Mick Tucker a while ago. A while ago I did a video and most of my videos have been really really shitty and um, especially the one about Mick Tucker. It's the edit is really really bad but I will still link it below because you seem to really really like it. It's the second most viewed and liked video on my channel I mean so why not link it? And I do want to say that these kinds of videos really do take a lot of time to make, to research and everything, to record. So please give me a like and a subscribe. I will be really really happy about it because it takes a long time time to make these videos but it's so worth it when you show that you really like to watch it. It motivates me a lot and it makes me happy. But I do think we should get right into the video. Brian Francis McManus Connolly was born on the 5th of October the year of 1945. He was the singer and the face of the band The Sweet which was a glam rock band that had its golden years in the 1970s with hits like Ballroom Blitz, Teenage Rampage, Fox on the Run, Wigwam Bam, Leo Willy, etc. etc. <laughs> there are so many hits and they were legendary. If I do this a lot it's because my hair is being like this and I can't sit like this. Something that I didn't know about Brian before I researched him this time because I have been a nerd when it comes to the sweets. <laughs> since I was 12 and 13, um, is that Brian had a half-brother named Mark McManus. Brian Connolly was born in Scotland. Um, I do not know exactly which town because I looked it up uh, on both Swedish and English and it said two things, which it usually does, so I'm not surprise or anything. Born in Scotland, in Great Britain obviously. The years in which Brian Connolly was active was year 1963 to year 1996. It does say on the English Wikipedia site that Brian was born in Glasgow and I do think that is true because I do think the English page is a lot more relevant since there are not a lot of facts on the Swedish one. So I mean, I'm gonna go with that. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I do want to know. The identity of Brian's father was never really revealed to the public, but his mother, however, was a teenage waitress. And her name was Francis or Francis. I do not know, but I'm gonna go with Francis as Connolly. And she left Brian as an infant in the Glasgow hospital. So Connolly then was fostered by another family and they started to foster him when he was the age of two. The name of his foster parents was Jim and Helen McManus of Blantyre. In a radio interview, Brian told that music was a big part of him growing up, or singing at least, he would often be asked to sing to both friends and family because there weren't really a lot of entertainment, such as television, for example, with a noisy background, um, excuse me for that, but it's my family. Connolly credited the Beverly Brothers for being his earliest influence, and the Everly Brothers were an American country-influenced rock and roll band, or not band, duo. And their years as actor was from 1951 to 2005. Pretty old band and they were active for quite some time actually. At the age of 12, Brian moved to Harefield, Greater London, where he attended the local secondary modern school. In Brian's mid-teens, he joined the Merchant, I believe it's pronounced, or Navy. And that's where he got his tattoo of a tiger's head tattooed into his arm. 
his uh, right arm. But in 1963, Brian returned to Harefield, and there he played in a number of local bands, including Generation X from mid-1965 to about well, October in 1966. Eventually, Connolly replaced Ian Gillon, which later became famous for him being in Deep Purple, in a band called Wainwright's Gentleman, which sounds familiar for you if you have watched my Mick Tucker Vax video, because Mick Tucker was actually included in this band already. Connolly and Tucker then later left together to go create another band. <laughs> Connolly and Tucker then later left the band together. Together with guitar player Frank Torpy and bass player Steve Priest. And they decided to call the band The Sweet Shop. Though on the eve of the day that they were gonna release their first single, with the band, uh, they changed the name to The Sweet. The first single The Sweet ever released was called Slow Motion. The band then recorded three further unsuccessful singles, and then Andy Scott joined the lineup just before the release of their first hit with the band, called Funny Funny. After they released this single and it became a huge hit, they got a lot of appearances on Top of the Pops. However, in 1974, a really, really sad event occurred. Brian Connolly was badly beaten after leaving a nightclub in Staines, where he received several kicks to his throat, resulting in him not being able to sing for a period of time and permanently losing some of the range in his voice. Permanently losing some of his vocal range in his voice. This sad, sad event meant a few things for the band. The band missed out on supporting The Who at Charlton Athletic Football Ground. And several of the songs on the Sweet Funny Adams album had to be sung by other members of the suite. As time progressed, issues between Brian and the other members of the suite did develop. And Brian would find the band excluding him, excluding him from decisions. On top of it all, Brian developed a significant alcohol problem in the mid-1970s. And soon he started to suffer from his alcoholism. During 1977, the problems within the band became even more apparent because Brian's voice started to show impacts of his very real alcohol abuse and that further compromised Brian's role within the band. Brian played his last British show with the original lineup of the suite at Hammersmith Odeon or Odeon, I do not know exactly how to pronounce it, but yeah, London. On 24th of February 1978 and his final live performance with the band was in July 1978 when they were supporting Alice Cooper in Florida, USA. Brian's departure wasn't made public until in March in 1979. After the news broke that Brian was leaving the suite, he was interviewed by the German magazine Bravo, where he told he was going to take time off to be with his family. And he was now considering a new style of music, um, most likely countryfied rock. By mid-1979, he had recorded a few new tracks at Chipping Norton Recording Studios in Oxfordshire with the help of his friend and producer Mick Angus. One of the tracks, Take Away the Music, was re-recorded the following year at Marquee Studios in London with then Polydor producer Pip Williams. Another event in Brian Connolly's life in 1979 was his first major appearance 
after leaving Sweet. And it was at Bravo Super Disco 79, held at the Olympia Hall, or Hall, I don't really know which way to pronounce it exactly. In Munich, or Munich, I don't, I don't know that either. On June 22nd, 10,000 people heard Connolly perform a sneak peek of his first solo Polydor single, Take Away the Music. This single is included on Polydor German Germany A Life or I Life compilation. In 1981, Brian was admitted to hospital with bloating and he sustained multiple heart attacks. This event in his life affected his health permanently with some paralysis on his left side which would later develop into a nervous system condition. The problems uh, were probably caused by Brian's excessive drinking combined with the use of prescription diuretic medicine. However, Brian was still standing strong and his next release was Don't You Know Lady composed by Roger Greenaway. It was also recorded by the British four-piece band Brooks shortly after Connolly's own release of the song. But the track failed to make an impact. In 1982, the contract with Polydor expired and Brian instead signed with French independent label Carrer <laughs> Records. I don't actually know how to pronounce that, but Career Career Records. There's dust on my hat. My hat is dusty. And there Brian recorded a dozen of new tracks. The plan was to have a complete album out by August in 1983, but it never happened. It, it was never done. During January, January of 1983, Brian supported Pat Benatar for three shows, including one at Hammersmith, Odeon, London. Connolly's encore included most of the members of Verity, fronted by ex-guitarist John Verity and Terry Utley from Smokey, he's a bass player. Songs played included Windy City, Fox on the Run, Hypnotized, and new numbers, Sick and Tired, Red Hair Rage, <laughs> what a coincidence, right? And Burning the Candle. Connolly and the band played two more dates for the Banatar tour. The Inland Revenue served Brian and the band with a multi-million pound tax assessment for the income earned off of their hit records. Connolly sold his house to pay for this for his share of the bill. That is crazy. You think that rock stars have an easy life? But they don't. They do not. Taxes, folks. From early 1984 and onward, despite recurrent uh, bad health from Connolly's side, he and the band still toured UK and Europe. And the band he toured with was called The New Suite, or New Suite. His most successful concerts were annual appearances in West Germany, before and after Germany's reunification. He visited other countries like Denmark, for example, and continued to perform sporadically in the UK. Connolly had stopped drinking in 1985, but he did, however, separate from his wife, Marilyn, and ended up divorcing in 1986. During 1987, Brian again encountered Frank Torpey, the guitar player of Original Suite, and he was in the band from 1968 to 69. According to Torpey, Brian was seeking a German record deal, or recording deal, and Frank invited Brian to go with him to the studio. As a project, Brian did run very, very late, but he did come and the track Sharantina was recorded, but it would not, however, be released until Torpy's 1998 album 
called Sweeter. In 1988, Brian did reunite with former members of the band, Mick Tucker, Steve Priest and Andy Scott, in Los Angeles, California, to rework studio versions of Action and the Ballroom Blitz. This was to be a trial run to see if a full reunion of the band would be possible for the America's MCA records. But the reunion was a failure due to the problems with Brian's voice at the time. And Connolly then returned to New Sweet. But Brian did, however, reunite with the other members of Original Sweet to promote for a music video documentary in London at Tower Records. In July 1990, Plans were made for Brian and his band, New Sweet, to tour Australia. A number of dates were planned, and the tour would start in Adelaide and proceed during November. However, the long flight to Australia did take out its right on Brian's health, and Brian again had to be hospitalised. And he was hospitalised in Adelaide Hospital for dehydration and related problems. The rest of the band, however, played a show in Adelaide without him to not disappoint the waiting fans. After several other shows, including one at the Dingley Powerhouse, Brian and the band played their final Australian date of the tour at Melbourne's Old Greek Theatre. With Connolly's suffering health in mind, it was decided not to extend the tour and some of the other later planned dates were abandoned. Brian went back to England and his band, and he, I think, and his band played at Bob Down, or Down, Bob Down Christmas show on the 18th of December 1990. During the early 1990s, Brian played the European oldies, circuit, or circuit, I, I don't know, and occasional outdoor festivals in Europe with his band. Plans suffered a small setback when a heavy duty tape recorder was stolen from the band's van at a gig in the Bristol Hippodrome with mud on March 22nd, 1992. It contained demos of four new songs, totaling in about 20 mixes. Legal problems uh, were continuing over the use of the name uh, Sweet or The Sweet between Connolly and Scott. Both parties did then, however, agree to distinguish their group's names to uh, help fans and promoters. New Sweet became Brian Connolly's Suite, and Andy Scott's version of the band were renamed Andy Scott's Suite. Brian Connolly's Suite continued to tour around Europe and UK. In 1994, Brian and his band played in Dubai. He appeared at the Galleria Theatre, Wyatt or Hyatt Regency. He also performed in Bahrain. By this time, Brian had healed his differences with McTucker and Steve Priest, and he was invited to Priest's oldest daughter Lisa's wedding. Then Steve flew back to England, and he and Brian performed together. Brian, once again, um, released an album in 1995, and it was called Let's Go and it was backed up with merchandising. In the same year, Brian's partner Jean also gave birth to their son. The same year, in 1995 also, Jean were successful in locating some of Brian's relatives. An aunt in Ontario, Ontario, Canada, revealed that Brian's true birth mother had unfortunately passed away in 1988. The aunt also informed him about that he had one living sister and one living brother in England that he met up with in England. On November 1996, British TV network Channel 4 aired a programme 
called Don't Leave Me This Way, which was about Brian's time as a pop star with the suite, the subsequent decline in the band's popularity and the impact on the band's members. The show revealed Brian's ill health, but also that he was continuing with concert dates at Butlins, where Connolly and his band had appeared a number of times during their tour during the early 90s. Brian Connolly's final concert was at the Bristol Hippodrome on the 5th of December in 1996 with Slade 2 and John Russell's glitter band, Experience. During January in 1997, Connolly had another heart attack and he was hospitalized in Sloth. 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 Slow. Slow. After only one week, Brian discharged himself, but he had to be readmitted the following week. This time, there were little that could be done for Brian, and Brian Connolly sadly passed away around midnight of the 9th to 10th of February in 1997, due to renal failure, liver failure and repeated heart attacks. He was 51 years old. Brian was cremated after a ceremony at the most holy name Roman Catholic Church at Old Mill Road, Denham, Buckinghamshire on Monday 17th of February 1997 and his ashes were scattered over the water by his daughters Nicola and Michelle. He was also survived by his ex-wife Marilyn and his then two-year-old son and girlfriend Jean. Fans did organise a memorial concert for Brian at Camden Palace in London on October 11th 1998. Money was raised for a plaque, or plaque, I still don't know how to pronounce that and I'm very sorry, I should have looked it up before making this video, I'm sorry. Dedicated to Brian at Breakspear Crematorium, Breakspear Road, Ruislip, Middlesex. It was unveiled on the 9th of February, the year 2000. In 2013, Connolly's son was competing in television talent show The X Factor. Brian Connolly, Connolly's son, vows not to cover any sweet songs in a bid to make his own mark on the music industry. The young Brian, who bears a strong resemblance to his, his legendary father, Brian Connolly, of the suite. I'm sorry for the noises, those are my dogs. I forgot to state that I'm reading a, a few things from a article about young Brian Connolly uh, competing in The X Factor. So I'm gonna read a few statements from him before he competed in The X Factor. The young Brian is hoping the ITV talent show will help lead him to a similar success and stardom, though he has no ambitions to follow the hard-living lifestyle which saw his dad die at just 51 after years of booze and drug abuse. The teenager says, I have done a few 70s show in which I've dressed up as 70s rockers with a long wig and makeup and performed hits by Mud, T-Rex and Sweet. But I wouldn't do that as an artist in my own right. I know my dad's music very well and I look very like him except I'm taller. I'm 5 foot 10 inches and dad was 5 foot 8 inches. And I have different hair. And that's basically the only difference. Those are the two differences from Brian's son and himself. They look completely similar in the face. It's actually pretty scary. He's, he's just like his dad's twin except he's a redhead and taller. I wouldn't try to imitate him. I'm a very different singer from him, more like Ed Sheeran and James Arthur. 
and I will not sing the same sort of music, neither will I get up on stage and say who Dad was, which is, uh, I think, a fair statement to make, because uh, his existence is not about his dad, and his own music career is not about his dad, it's about himself, and also, like, I think he really much want to make his own career and not base it off his father being famous. I think he wants to be famous for himself and that's what he's trying to say. Brian's mother Jean described the birth of her and Brian's son, uh, Brian Jr. or what to say, the young Brian, as the happiest day in their four-year relationship. Brian was so delighted that he was sleeping around the hospital room where their son were born. And another statement, or a few other statements from the young Brian. I do find that sad, that he has no memories of him, of his uh, father. But it happens to quite a lot of people in this world. It might be easier, or it might have been easier for me to make my way in the music industry if my dad was here to advise and guide me. But I'm working hard like he did and hopefully that pays off. I have loads of pictures, mainly of dad as a performer and me as a baby with, with him. I particularly treasure dad's necklace with a little golden microphone on, microphone on it. Now when I watch old videos of my dad with Sweet, I hope one day I'll be as good as that. I'm sure dad would be proud of me because I'm working as a singer. He was somebody for me to live up to because he tried hard to become what he was and he succeeded very well. I'm inspired to try and get where he was. Of course he's proud of you and I think he's proud of you because you have decided not to take the path he did when it comes to drugs and alcohol. If he were living I think he would definitely have advocated not to um, start doing those things. Young Brian wrote in this article or said in this interview for the article that he did not drink a lot he does he does not drink a lot only for social things and he stays completely away from drugs he acknowledged that he might have some genes that makes him more prone to or genes i mean traits from his dad that makes him more prone to become addicted. I think one thing we don't think about when it comes to alcoholists is that they do suffer from addiction. It is an illness. It is not something that a person chooses. You can choose to drink a lot of booze, but some people can do that and stop when they want to. Some people cannot stop. Some people get addicted and I think it's really important to acknowledge that is that it actually is an illness and that it is not anyone's fault. Brian lived and died before I was even born. His existence was before I was even born. His son, his youngest son, is five years older than me. I don't think Brian was a bad person at all. I think he was addicted and that that was something that ruined his life, that shortened his life. He cut his life in half and he died by 51 he should have lived so many more years but his addiction took it all away from him and i did not live in the 70s 80s 90s all those years he lived and i have heard from example my my mother was living in these ages and mental illness which addiction is. Um, it's in your brain. I, I think it's a mental illness at least. But those things like addiction and mental illness, mental health really, because that's why you go to alcohol, because you're stressed. And I think really that's why he did drink excessive. And you didn't, you didn't talk about things like mental health back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. I'm very lucky to be alive, I feel like, in the time that I am because mental health is something you're starting to talk about a lot more. Addiction is something you talk about a lot more and the care that is necessary for recovering from things like addiction, it's much better these days. We've improved 
and uh, it's not at all as shameful, I believe. There's no information that he, he ever, like, admitted himself to care. I don't know if there even were care available for him. If it was, it was probably not as good as today. I'm, I'm telling you not to judge, right? When you hear the word alcoholist, it has this bad ring to it, or this bad aura around the word and around the illness. I think that's extremely important to acknowledge that it is not shameful, it is not the person's fault that suffers from it. I, I understand that the band, the rest of the band, of course, also suffered, because people who stand by also stand by you as you suffer from illness also get affected. They had their lives when he always got late and were drunk, maybe didn't do the work as good as he would have done if he weren't drunk. It affected, affected his voice and that affected their careers. He couldn't help any of that, but he still affected the other members because they had their private lives, they had their wives, they had their, they had their children. Of course, if they had to work overtime all the time, that is going to take out its right on the other members as well. But I still think it's important to acknowledge that Brian was an alcoholist, but it was not his fault. And I really, really like Brian. I really, really love Brian. I think he was talented. I think he... I just feel like it. I don't know Brian. I didn't know Brian because I wasn't even born when he was around. But I just feel like he was a kind-hearted person who really, really wanted to work with music. Because throughout all the story of his life, Whatever happened, he still, he still got back on track, he still got up on stage. He played his, like, final concert just a few months before he died. I think that's commitment, and I think he loved music so much. I think he loved his family, I think he loved his children. I think he was a loving person who had problems, who had an illness that was not treated properly that was not acknowledged properly. The story of his life could have been so much better if it were, if it were just longer and if it was just someone who would have acknowledged him and his abuse of alcohol and his illness, basically. And that, that is just to me really sad. But well, it was really important to me to make this video because I did make a similar video to Mick Tucker. It's not as long story but it is a longer story because he lived longer than Brian did so it is longer but the details because Brian was a frontman he was like the face of the band and I think that's why there are so much more details about his life and I actually already have another another rock star in mind to make a video about in the series I did rock stuff acts and I really, really hope you enjoyed this video because I really, really enjoyed to make it. So, to Brian, rest in peace. And also, him being cremated and let over the water, I actually think is a really, really, really beautiful thing to do. I believe in reincarnation. In the biological way, or the logical way, that you die. If you're in a coffin, you rot in, you become earth. And if you're scattered, you become anything. You're letting the person live on by nature. I think that is really beautiful and deep. And, uh, well, as always, thank you for watching my little video. Probably a big video. Um, but I hope you liked it. And if you did, give me a comment. If you like Brian, give him a comment. That was everything for this video. And um, I hope to see you next time in my next video. See ya. Bye. Their success hasn't been overnight. We had a couple of years, like about two and a half years, up and down, up and down, up and down. You know. Actually, this is a good point to stress because we've, we've done the road work. We've, we've grafted. We've done the 20 pound a night. As you know, the clothes right from the word go. They weren't quite the quality or style, but I mean... <laughs> Like the first shirts were made of curtain material. <laughs> While this is less outrageous than it used to be, they're still busy thinking up new gimmicks for themselves. We manage ourselves because we've had years of experience with managers, you know, and I'm afraid there's only one way to do it. You've either got a, a great manager from the word go, you know, I can name a few groups that have, 
or you meet them all. You know, and we've met them all. The early singles. They thought uh, we were only in it for the money. Yeah, they were very commercial. Uh, you know, a production. You know, it was down to the producer really. It wasn't that record's good because the suite did it. It was that record's good because it was well produced. You know. Yeah. That was it. Frightened to like we, us. We got no respect at all. Where I come from. I've been back once in 12 months. You know, I know a lot of people there, but there's no time to sort of see them. Being in the business we are, it's a lifestyle. And the higher you get, the more successful you become, the more the involvement is. It's 24 hours a day. We're all wrapped up in suite. We've been out at, um, in Munich, and the Olympic Games was on at the time. So we'd been with Mark out there. You know, he's, uh, he knew who I was, although he was he was a lot bigger at the time than we were. No, I'm not sure if he was in Germany or not, but he, he was definitely... He, he, just after doing the Munich thing with him, I was opening the curtains one day. I had a flat, and it was opposite a record company. Can't name things, can I? But anyway, it was opposite a record company, the flat. It was down at the base, the ground floor flat. And it was one day I was just happening to be open front curtains and there's a Rolls Royce sitting outside in the traffic because it was a narrow road outside waiting to go into the record company turning waiting to turn in and there's Mark perched on the back of the Rolls not not in the back seat on the back of the car you know like so as he's higher up than than the car and he just happened a glimpse around and he saw me in the window. And, I, and he just, well, he didn't say it, he just pointed. Just to say, oh, I know you. Or something like that. But he jumped out of the car and he came in and had a cup of tea in the flat. But that's one that stands out because like, around that time, you know, there was a lot of people, a lot of girls worked at the record company and that. And, and there's EMI. I just dropped the top in it, I've named them now. But there they are, they're all waiting there in their reception for him to arrive and, uh, in, his, in his car. They see me in, on, on route as he's about to pull in there, jumped out and he's sitting in my front room and there's crowds of kids waiting across the way. <laughs> And it was wrong, you know. In a way, the cardiacs probably, I hate to say, it, did me a favour. But um, so that was I what don't know if I would have had the willpower that I, because um, so that you I, stopped after you'd had the heart. Well, after the cardiacs, I never touched a drop. And, I, and people say to me, oh, "You must have had you know, tremendous willpower." Well, it wasn't just willpower; it was fear. You know, it was fright. Having known about the cardiacs and been told by specialists how bad I was and how lucky I was, I think the fear of more than as much as the willpower stopped me from ever touching it again. 
I mean, we can't help noticing that you, you, you still shake slightly. Is that a result of... Uh, no, that isn't. Because people must think, oh, you've no. been on the bottle again. No, no. <laughs> no, that came years later. Yeah, that's what a lot of people think. Yeah. But uh, that came years later. I had a... It came about five or six years ago. And I was back after the car. I was playing football regularly for well, showbiz teams and things. And um, just, uh, I was working pretty, you know, solidly about six years ago. And I got pneumonia. And septicemia set in to me as well. And I got... I healed from that, you know, I got um, the OK, I was, you know, I went home from hospital and I noticed I was shaking, I looked like a quiver. And it's been a problem ever since. It doesn't stop you singing all right though, does it? I mean, that's the extraordinary no, thing. I mean, you sound just the same. And it doesn't bother me on stage at all. Is that right? You stop on stage then? Yes.